Score more for less with our NK News Shop discount campaign. Ready to upgrade your wardrobe with some unique flair? At the NK News Shop, podcast listeners buying any two items from our t-shirt or hoodie collections will snag their third for half off. Whether you're eyeing our North Korea-themed gear for yourself or as gifts, now is the perfect time to act. Don't miss out. Head to shop.nknews.org and make the most of this limited time offer. That's shop.nknews.org. Welcome to the NK News Podcast. I'm your host, Jacko Swetsloop. Today, it is Tuesday, the 14th of May, 2024, and I'm talking to Jongmin Kim via StreamYard. Jongmin, it's like a podcast crossover. You're the host of Korea Pro. I'm the host of NK News. Here we are together. Welcome on the show. Thank you. It's a host-to-host podcast. I love it. It's host-to-host and coast-to-coast. Yes. So (laughs) most recent news, well, it was interesting last week, President Yoon gave his first press conference in almost two years. Were you there for that? No, unfortunately, I didn't make the cut. I got caught off, although I registered. But many of my other foreign media colleagues went and asked fantastic questions. Thank you very much, everyone. Great, great. What what did he have to say that's uh, relevant to us here at NK News? Well, firstly, when it comes to North Korea, we all, uh, many of you might not remember, but when Yoon started his term, like if we remember back a lot of episodes we talked about uh yoon's hot-headed moments right mm-hmm, like he used mm-hmm. to talk about preemptive strikes he used to talk about the kim jong-un leadership how north korea is a main enemy so on and so forth he used to focus a lot on north korea but i guess the uh, most notable thing to me in relations to this topic and the listeners here would be that his um, hot-headed remarks are gone he wow. was very he was very tame and whatever questions that were that were linked to North Korea, although it was kind of linked to other foreign policy questions, he only referred to North Korea when it comes to North Korean threat in line with how US South Korea extended to deterrence is important and so on and so forth. So that was one thing. But another thing that the, got the most media interest, international media interest, was his response to Russia North Korea military cooperation issue. Ah, what did he say about Russia, Korea, Russia, North Korea military cooperation? Well, technically, the policy line didn't change. So the logic is the same, but always the president's remarks are important, not just with the content, but about their tone, right? And mm-hmm. his tone changed slightly when it comes to North Korea and Russia. The question was, uh, what I actually wanted to ask as well, um, North Korea has been allowed to basically test its weapons that are made to use in attack against South Korea in Russia's battlefield in Ukraine. And the question was, and you have, South Korea has been doing a very limited response to this military cooperation. And do you have any red line against Russia that South Korea would not stand? Which which was a very good question, I thought. Mm -hmm. And he sidestepped the question, of course, did not answer what the red line is. And a lot of foreign media correspondents, we expected his response to be something like, oh, sanctions. Uh, Russia is doing this um, illegal invasion of Ukraine and North Korea's provision of these weapons are violation of U.S. Security Council resolution, period. I thought he will just end at that. But he started his response with, Russia has been a very friendly nation with our country for several years, many, many years. But Hmm. recently we are in a different and difficult, uncomfortable position But I would love to maintain an amicable ties when it comes to economic relations and take Russia's relation to a case by case basis. Mm. Um, He did accuse Russia for the illegal invasion, but he did not really go into how such North Korean weapons will be or are dangerous to South Korean security. He He did not touch on anything related to South Korean military. But he focused on the economic ties with Russia, which raised a few eyebrows in D.C. Gosh, okay, yeah. Interesting. I I wonder, actually, I wondered this aloud a few times, but whether there have been any North Korean observers spotted in Russia or on or near the battlefield watching how North Korean weapons are performing. Because I think uh, if that does happen, if they do get verified as being in the area, that, uh, that may change the response a little bit from South Korea. Right. That's what we have been seeing, actually, right? A lot of different types of North Korean weapons. And 
just yesterday, TV Joseon did this exclusive about North Korea's new types of weapons going into uh, Russia's arsenal. But mm -hmm. uh, South Korea's response has been the same. They have not responded above how this is sanctions breach. And yeah. they tend not to respond to anything related to its potential risk against South Korean military. But also a lot of military experts like Anki Panda, they also pointed out that although a lot of the missiles are, I guess, uh, malfunctioning in the mm -hmm. battlefield in the in Ukraine, there might be other variables than just the technical capability of these missiles that are impacting that, such as the shipping period as well. That that might be also influencing the missile functionality. Uh, coming back to, uh, to President Yoon's press conference, has there been any response either from Russia or the United States to uh, his words? Not really, because he, like from Russia and, Russia's point of view, this is very fond answer, I guess, that they can get in this time, this day and age. When it comes to China, he actually did not make that much remarks regarding that. And also because only four questions were given to foreign relations related stuff, we didn't really ask, people really, really didn't ask China or Taiwan related questions. Mm. It was just Ukraine, Russia, and the possible return of Trump, we, he, which he also sidestepped the question. Right. Okay. Wow. Now, I understand that Pak Sang Hak is back, the uh, the prominent uh, North Korean defector who likes to stage media events around the sending of balloons to North Korea. So what's uh, mm. what's he up to these days? Just yesterday, it's been a while. I I used to always cover this, but there used to be more. But then after you know the anti leaflet law going into effect, there was there were much less activities. Although he always did it uh, occasionally. He was one of the 27 people who filed, uh, filed to the, filed the anti leaflet law to the constitutional court, so, mm. and, and he won. So, so it was ruled unconstitutional, uh, infringement of freedom of speech. So this was actually the first time that he did a balloon launch after the anti leaflet law was found unconstitutional. And this time he gave media a very good, I guess, headline soundbite by including K-pop into the mix I mean, into the USB, to be more specific. Ah, okay, so it's um, not just I, leaflets, yeah. it's USBs. Okay. So it used to be, I, I was wondering if I should do a cheeky headline linking gospel to uh, keep up what I didn't do that, uh, Brian's idea. But um, he used to put Bibles in, into the balloon alongside leaflets and US dollars. But this time it was, I guess, was it 300,000 leaflets and USBs in 20 balloons, I think. Wow, okay, gosh. We don't uh, know for sure if there are any BTS fans in uh, in North Korea, but uh, if there are, they may find some of these uh, these USBs. Has uh, has anyone from any of the K-pop management companies made a uh, a complaint or a comment about this? I wonder whether they're happy or if they don't care too much. I actually, when I reached out to Park Sung Hak and asked, "Do you can you tell me who which artist that you included into the USB? Do you know who's popular these days in North Korea?" And he he said that he included, of course, Jungkook and V from BTS. So I included that as the kicker quote. Ah, uh, yes. But I I did try to um reach Hype. <laughs> I actually yes. actually did, but they did not respond. <laughs> Yeah, I understand they're busy with other matters these days. Aren't oh, they? they are very, very busy these days right now. Yeah. Now, uh, moving right along, former President Donald Trump, who's running for re-election, he's been, of course, busy lately with his uh, his trial in New York, but he did have some time to uh, to say some things about uh, what might happen to uh, the U.S.-Korea alliance and the U.S. troop presence here if he becomes uh, president once again. So. Fill us in on that one, please, Jongmin. This covering this gave me, I guess, a PTSD sort of sort um, of covering all his crazy remarks during when he was a president that he would tweet out. And this was one of those things, but it was a Time magazine. He said that uh, South Korea is very wealthy right now and implied that the U.S. could withdraw troops from this wealthy South Korea if it doesn't pay more to defend against North Korea. And he sort of reiterated these longstanding grievances about defense cost sharing. But then this is my eloquent, fancy, smart version of his remarks. Um, but the Time magazine interview, it was like this. We have a lot of troops. We have a lot of troops. Uh, one thing we can do, there are a lot of options. We can move them out very quickly to certain locations. And he went on and on and on about how he, he championed the cost sharing negotiations so that South Korea can pay more 
false. He failed. The negotiation stalled at the time. So Biden administration <clears throat> negotiated later. So he did a lot of false accusations or false remarks about how many troops are here from the U.S. Um, U.S. USFK soldiers are here. Yeah. But bottom line is he's he referred to how wealthy South Korea is and that uh, U.S. is not interested in paying that more. OK, now I know that uh, it's been a topic of discussion in South Korea lately that uh, that if U.S. troops were ever to be withdrawn, this might be the time for South Korea to get its own nuclear weapons and. Recently, the uh, the CSIS did a uh, uh, what made made a statement about uh, that based on some uh, some research, some polling of South Korean elites. So uh, tell us about that. Right. Um. I actually interviewed Victor Cha, the main author of the report for uh, Korea Pro. So if anyone's interested, check it out. I did yes. raise a lot of um, limitations and doubts and questions I got from academics uh, about this. I I just posed them directly to him, and he actually accepted most of the limitations. But the bottom line of the CSIS, um, I would say research, because it's 150 something um, experts, it was difficult to make it into an actual formal survey. Um, and he confirmed that as well. But it was interesting how at least South Korean elites, which includes policymaker, former and current officials, experts here, South Korean nationals, they are, you know, how pop South Korean public always sort of 70% say that they sort of want nuclear weapons when they're, it's not a conditional statement, right? Mm -hmm. But only 30% or so wants nuclear weapons and 50% or so are against them and 13% are, they don't really have a preference. So it shows that in, I guess, in default mode, they are not that interested or really against it considering the reputational cost, it seems, even more so than the US-South Korea alliance issue. But if there is a decoupling rhetoric and the fear of abandonment comes back, 50% of the elites who previously answered that they are anti-nuclear weapons would change their mind. So the Yoon Presser question about Trump's return and what his plan is was actually in line with this increasing, I guess, expert concerns about South Korean experts return to the idea of nuke loving nation, but mm -hmm. it's it's actually been quiet in South Korea before this report. Oh, but when you say so, when you say elites, so these are people mostly with PhDs or are either university professors or think tank people, right? Okay, so uh... yeah. So so he responded that Dr. Cha said that he had to, uh, although it's anonymous, so he couldn't really ask two specific questions about their ex uh, expertise, but yeah. he pulled their level of education and 80% was PhD holders. Okay, so of those people who responded to the uh, survey, about half of them will uh, change their mind and, and go uh, pro-nuclear if there is a decoupling between the United States and Korea. Is that right? Right, right. But I try to push back on that because I, I, I did hear from a few experts about the concern about methodology here because it seemed like he wasn't that clear on the the threshold of the fear of abandonment uh, because ah. it could go, be as extreme as withdrawing U.S. forces from Korea to just decoupling rhetoric from someone like yeah. Trump. It seems like um, he didn't really gauge that in the survey. So that could be a bit of a um, loophole. OK, well, I guess for, for me, the, the, the still the definite take home here is how noticeable it's been in the last few years that uh, nuclear weapons in South Korea has become part of polite conversation, whereas exactly. uh, 10, exactly. 10, 15 years ago, nobody was talking about it. And now mm. we're doing surveys about it. We're talking about it at press conferences. So. Uh, it's definitely part of the conversation now. I guess that's what Yoon earned, ironically, after bringing it up in one of his other hot, um, hot-headed remark incident in earlier last year, when he, out of nowhere, nobody asked him, out of nowhere mentioned that South Korea has the te te uh, technology and the capability to have our own nuclear weapons. But because we sort of really trust the U.S., we wouldn't do that. But mm -hmm. after he mentioned it, he got nuclear consultative group, he got Washington Declaration, he got a bunch of strategic assets visiting South Korea. If Trump looks at this and reviews this and sees this as something like a concession, mm -hmm. he would try to make a deal out of it, probably. Probably would, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, okay. and, and that kind of brings us back to where we started. And it's interesting that given the context of uh, Yoon's previous hot-headedness, that he's seen, he came across as quite temperate and measured. Uh, at this most recent press conference. Well prepared. So mm. in the Korea Pro podcast episode just 
an hour after we saw the remarks at the press conference, John and I kept saying how clever and smart he sounded in a few occasions. We never, ever said that about him. So that was a change. It's true. I've, I've never heard either of you say that about him before. <laughs> Uh, so I would I do want to encourage our listeners to go across to uh, to careerpro.org and listen to the podcast that was released just last Friday, I think, uh, between you and John. So uh, go check it out. Thanks, John Min, for coming on the NK News podcast this week. Thank you very much, Jaco. Welcome to a new realm of insights into the Korean Peninsula. At Korea Risk Group, we delve deep into the complexities of North and South Korea, offering bespoke analyses that empower decision makers. Whether you're in government, business or academia, our tailored solutions provide clarity in an opaque region. Let our team guide your strategy with data-driven insights and on-the-ground intelligence. Step into a world of informed decision making and visit careerriskgroup.com today. Hello, podcast listeners. Welcome to the NK News Podcast. I'm your host, Jacko Zwetslut. And today, I have here in the studio with me, Professor Benjamin Joano, who's a professor at Hongik University. Uh, he is a French cultural anthropologist specializing in Korean studies. And today, we're going to be talking about his uh, massive film database that he has recently released to the public, as well as North Korean films. And then we'll finish up with a very interesting book that he has published in the last couple of years, co-published, co-authored, about doing research, doing field work in North Korea. So welcome on the show, Ben. Thank you very much, Jacko. Okay, thanks for coming and making your time today. So first of all, this database that you put together, you and, and two collaborators have created this North Korean feature films database, NKFFD for short, with almost 800 titles. Why bother? Why did you do this? And what was your aim at the start? Actually, I started because I was studying North Korean movies and it was very difficult when I started more than uh, 15 years ago, probably, to get the materials. And I realized that there was no complete database, mm -hmm. at least no database on which I could rely for, you know, academic research. And then I started so to get... So you IMDb is not good enough? Yes. Okay. Yes, actually. <laughs> All right. No, you have bits here and there, but, you know, most of the, the databases are not uh, databases that you can use yeah. easily, like uh, what I try to do, like on a kind of Excel file, you know. Yes. So you cannot research them and cannot complete them. And that's what was missing. And since I have a kind of anthropological approach, which is kind of close to structuralism. It means I love to do lists ah. and work with uh, a, a certain quantity of uh, materials. Okay. My approach is not per se quantitative, but I like to have a lot of movies to analyze yep. to see the patterns, yes. the recurring patterns. Right. That's why I wanted to have the possibility to get a kind of large picture of North Korean cinema, historically, diachronically speaking. And the database started like that, you know, one movie after the other, and then we ended up with almost 800. Right. And it, yeah, it's on a, uh, a Google spreadsheet, so it's like an Excel format. And just for our audience who may not have seen it yet, but we'll share the link to this in the show notes so people can look at it. You've got uh, the Korean title, the English title, official if there is one, and if it isn't official, it's in italics. Then the studio that made it, the names of the, uh, the director, the screenwriter, the main actors, the length of the film, which year it was published, what, what's the genre, and is it in the collection of the North Korean Material Center at the National Library down in Sochogu in Seoul, and whether it's on YouTube. So if it's on YouTube, you put a link there, presumably to the original film, and then the last column, any other, other source. So that's pretty comprehensive. But you're saying that nothing like this existed before. It's very hard to believe that in 2022 that here we are, we've never had a North Korean film database before. We had. We had ah. made by several uh, researchers, mm -hmm. Korean professors who wrote books about North Korean cinema. We have a list which is quite comprehensive at the Pukan Chadio Center, you yes. know, the North Korean uh, Information Center at the National Library, etc., etc. But none of them are really comprehensive. They are, for example, at the Pukan Chadio Center, you have, I think, around 440 
Okay, which uh, is about movies only. more than half of, of your list. Exactly. But what's missing then? A lot of them. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, here and there. You know, it's not only a period of time. It's just that they did, all of them did what we have to do, which mm-hmm. is rely on what we find by chance, for example, on the Chinese market. Yep going to North Korea directly, what we can buy in North Korea, right. and what is going around on the internet. Okay. Because North Korea itself doesn't provide, I, I guess they have, but don't provide a complete list. You cannot go to North Korea to mm. a library and say, I want to have a complete list of your movies. But it has published books on North Korean movies, but they, they don't include that, that kind of bibliographical uh, no. detail? No. Oh. And these books were very important for us mm. because I, I, I bought all these books. Yeah. And it was the base for us to, you know, crisscross the the, the references to be sure yep. that movies really exist. We are never completely sure, but right. at least going f- com- going to the North Korean source, it was a way to verify what we had. Yeah. But uh, even these books, for obvious political reasons, are not complete. Okay. And w- when you say political reasons, what do you mean? Well, we have been told in yep. North Korea by colleagues who made us understand that some movies may disappear from the market and even from North Korean television, from uh, the distribution mm-hmm. uh, platforms. Can you think of reasons why that might happen? Yes, because the people involved in that movie are not any more politically acceptable, the no. director or the actor, for example. Now, okay, let me think of one example of a film that might fit into that category, and that's the film uh, Dora Oji Anan Milsa, or the... Uh, Emissary of No Return or An Emissary Unreturned from 1984. That one was directed by Shin Sang-ok, the South Korean filmmaker who was kidnapped to, uh, to North Korea under orders of Kim Jong-il. And the script was apparently written by his wife, Che Eun-hee. Now, that film is in your database. And in fact, when I was in North Korea in 2019, I was able to purchase the DVD. They're still selling the DVD of this, uh, at least where foreigners are able to go. It may have even been it may have been in the small souvenir shop inside the uh, the Arch of Triumph in All Paris. Right. Yes. Or the Juchetel. One of those. I bought it there. And indeed, their names do not appear in the credits. So it's as if the film has no director. But the film is all there. So if, exactly. the, if, if that is not a film that has disappeared, what it, can you think of any films that definitely have disappeared and they wouldn't ever sell it or show it or talk about um, it again? I don't have it in mind now, but I remember going to the Moran Bong shop yeah. in Pyongyang, which is you know the big production company yeah. and international distributor of North Korean films. And the ladies at the shop were a little bit you know, uncomfortable ah. with the movies I asked. Ah, you, you had a list. I had a list okay. of things I was looking for. Yeah. And they looked at each other and they were like, you know, and that's when uh, some of the North Korean colleagues with us took me on the side and ah. explained me, you know, these movies are exist but right. do, are not available anymore. Okay. Now, they weren't Shin Sang-ok films, were they? Uh, no, it, okay. no, no, it was not. No, but I know that uh, uh, other movies by Ch- Shin Sang Wok may not be available, like ah. uh, the the Chunyang version. Okay, that's so what I've been told. Interesting then that they, the the one about the Hague emissaries, they allow that one to still be sold, but not this one. But okay, so that being said, Benjamin, what what's the big picture we can learn from this database? Well, there there will always be a, a, a weak dimension in in this database because it gives us an image of mm-hmm. North Korean cinema. Yeah. But it's a partial image, and we shouldn't forget that because even though we have worked hard to find a lot of titles, yes. first, we don't know if these titles correspond to a real movie all the time because some of them are just titles for us. We, we found them on the, in different sources, yes. uh, and we have uh, put online, of course, the list of the sources we have used. But sometimes they are, let's say, uh, magazines, mm-hmm. periodicals. Yeah. So we don't have the DVD and we haven't watched the movie. So we are not sure about it, even though we have all the credits. Yeah. Yeah. So that's complicated to know if a movie still exists. Many of the movies may have disappeared for political, but also for technical reasons, like in South Korea. Yeah. We have lost a lot of movies from the 50s, 60s and 70s for technical reasons, because they reused, as you know, the film material. Yes. Yep. Yep. And that also happened, uh, I know, uh, when I was... a. Uh, a youngster, I was a big fan of Doctor Who, the original series, and some of those original reels were this film was reused, oh, really? and so the original episode of Doctor Who from 1960s and 70s, some of those were actually missing. Oh, uh, because I, I did, terrible, <laughs> so yeah, sad. Yeah, so it's a bit like re- reusing an old VHS uh, back in the day. You just go exactly, over it again. Exactly. Exactly. Interesting. Now, w- when you say sometimes it's just a title, where were you getting that title from? If you if you're not if you've never seen the actual film. 
Where's the title coming from? As I said, we cross different references. Yeah. Some of them appear in several books from North Korea, yeah. also from uh, South Korean researchers. And also we uh, had a look at some of the periodicals, yes. North Korean periodicals, uh -huh. uh, which were published for a long time about North Korean cinema. And they would give you sometimes even the synopsis, the full scenario of uh -huh. a movie. Yeah. And uh, you get a lot of information through these kind of sources. But it doesn't mean that we can find the movie mm -hmm. when we went, for example, several times to North uh, China, yeah. to North Korea, and also going to the Pukan Shadow Center in Seoul. Yeah. You know, some of the movies are not loca locatable. <laughs> you cannot uh, yeah. find them. Then for us, there are titles. That's why I wanted this uh, database to be open, like a kind of open source so right. that people can intervene, yep. give us comments and mm -hmm. say, well, this movie, it sounds good, but yep. it never existed. And I have the proof. And ah. we're exchanging this information to amend the list, yep. you know, as, as we use it. Because I'm sure that there are a lot of wrong information, mm. information which are probably also redundant. So right. a movie may appear two times on a, under a different title. That's yep. what I'm afraid of. <laughs> that may happen. So, right. so this database is a work in process. So was there a, a Joseon Yonghwa, a Korean movies periodical at some stage? Yes, And when did course. they stop making that? I think it was around the 1990s, 97, ah. I think. Okay. Now, I, I have to say, uh, your experience is very much paralleled with my own. Uh, I have produced a database of North Korean comic books from the 1950s until the, uh, the 2020s. And I have, um, uh, I think, 840 titles, so a little bit more than you wow. have films in your database. But similarly, you know, there is, for example, this, this annual book that's published in North Korea. I forget the exact title. It's got a long title, like Chosun uh, Yesul Pum, something, something, Yollam. And it's basically an annual almanac of every artwork produced by North Korea. And it's, so it's divided up into chapters. And there's one on films and there's one on the movies. And, exactly. and, there's, and there's one on books. And in the book chapter, there's a subsection of Kurimchek, which is comic books. And I have gone through that list for all the years where I can find that book. And so I have a list of, in my database, there are books that were in that that almanac, but I've never seen them. And I've even been, when I was in 2019 in North Korea, I said, have you got this one? Have you got this one? Have you got this one? They're only published in the last two or three years. And they said, no, we've not got them. So, exactly so the I'm same not for sure us. that every title that I've got has been published as a book. So that's interesting that Exactly, yes. exactly, because we use also this kind of annual your books yeah, for the course. cinema. Yeah. So, and they, they, it's interesting because they give you, for example, the number of films for yeah. a movie which were circulating in, in North Korea. Right. So we don't know how many people watch the, the movie, but we know how many times it has been shown. Ah. So it can indicate if a movie, in a certain way, yep. was seen as successful. Because it's all, of course, it's a, you know, a very official information. Yep. But anyway, it gives you information that are uh, interesting. But that's, also, that's what I want to really emphasize is the, the, the limitation of that database. Yeah. It's a work in progress and we are going, I hope, with other researchers, mm -hmm. people like you who have interest in North Korea, yeah. to complete, to correct, to amend. And uh, there is still a lot of work to do. For mm -hmm. example, in the last columns, which are now empty. Yeah. And I want to be able in the future to give the information where to find these movies. Right. Uh, if not on YouTube, outside then of where? North Korea, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, this is the North Korean feature films database. So, what kind of films did you exclude from this? We exclude the short movies. We exclude the TV series. Mm -hmm. We exclude uh, what we would call documentaries. Ah, yes, the Kwahak Yongwa. Okay, and ch children movie yep. like animation. Okay, so oh, so animation is excluded. All right. Now, you've got a, a number of uh, genres that I saw in the database. Some of them are pure. Uh, genres and some of them are mixed or hybrid genres. Can you briefly tell us about what the genres are and, and how you classified the films? We used the North Korean classification ah. because we could, of course, always uh, use another kind of frame, mm -hmm. uh, our frame, but that wouldn't be probably as meaningful as using what North Korean themselves indicate to us in their fa uh, famous catalogs, yeah. you know, published in North Korean and in English. So it means that's the way they want us to see their, their cinema. So I thought it was uh, more probably meaningful to use these categories, these genres. And it's true that some of them apparently have only one or two movies inside, you know, like right. very few, very, very few. So you, you've got war. Uh, that's obviously a, a popular genre, as it is in comic books. And then you've got revolution, anti-Japanese movement, socialist realism. 
or socialist reality, I should say. That's different. I would en- yeah, yeah I, tell I, me more. I would emphasize on the difference because socialist realism is something yeah. we know very well, right. historically, aesthetically speaking. But in North Korea, the, 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 the word they are using, the expression they are using is slightly different. Ah. It is a genre of movies which deal about the uh, we deal with the uh, everyday reality right. of a perfect socialist or ideal socialist society, which is North Korea, yep. with the problems encountered in this kind of society and the way to overcome these problems okay. in order to perfect the society. So this is, if you want, mm-hmm. uh, not exactly what we would call realism at right. all. It has nothing to see, for example, with the Italian, you know, neo- neo-realistic school yep. or British uh, movies are claiming to be realistic. Right. This is actually more idealistic. Yeah, okay. Yeah. A, a reality to come, I would say. Right. And that's really interesting because this genre, which was especially popular from the 1980s, it yep. became, and that's why the, the data list is interesting because you can see the evolution of the the, the genre of movies uh, according to the uh, era mm. and from the 1980s you have more and more of these socialist reality movies yeah. and through these movies you can see what are the problematics of North Korean regime mm-hmm. according to uh, North Korean society and industry and everything yeah. related to production for example right. and it tells us not what is exactly North Korea and how people live and what they do, but at least it shows us what are the problems. Mm. And these problems are not always the same. Right. So we have really an agenda of the day. That's why um, it gives us really this sense that contrary to what we may think or what some people may say, North Korean cinema, you cannot speak in general mm. about that. It has a history. Yeah. We need an histori- historical contextualization of the movies yeah. because something produced in the 1980s doesn't have the same goals, right. aims, or agenda than something which is more recent. So that's what uh, this database helps us realize. Mm-hmm. Uh, the war movies also, or spy movies, yeah. uh, espionage, it's more something from the 70s. Yeah. It has a tendency to disappear after 1980s. Mm. During the 1990s, you don't have war movies. It's Well, you have, you have, sorry. You have yeah. some movies involving the soldiers, which okay. is different because not all the time it is a war situation. Right. But and the historical genre of the fatherland liberation um, movies, yeah. it is something also which is quite uh, located in the early 70s and early 80s as well. I tell you what's interesting for me, just scrolling down the, uh, the database here, uh, socialist reality seems to be the most common uh, genre or the biggest genre with the most films in it. And that's actually quite the opposite of how it is with the, uh, the comic books. In, the, in terms of the revolution, the war, the espionage, these are very, very big themes in both the movies and in comic books. But socialist reality is almost absent from comics. Mm, it, interesting. It, it doesn't appear at all. And yet it's the most common in, in movies. So it, it, but I'm not surprised because the, the essence of North Korean cinema, which is completely centralized, mm-hmm. is not to be an entertainment. And that's why we call it cinema because we translate the word Yongwa uh-huh. uh, by the, the English word cinema or what it means in, also in South Korean language. But we are in a completely different situation of production. So the end result should be also taken differently. These movies are not made for pure entertainment. Mm-hmm. If they are entertaining, it's nice. But the real goal, and it is said again and again in all the North Korean literature, yeah. Yeah. It is to educate. It is a weapon. Mm-hmm. It is a social weapon of education. Yeah. And they, they use the word propaganda yeah. very clearly. It is to propagate the, uh, the information of the day that people should get, how to behave, how to think, what to say, mm-hmm. what kind of vocabulary to use. For example, if we enter the Songun, yeah. Army First Era, people even in the far countryside have to know that the phraseology has changed. Mm. And how do they know that? by watching the TV, the news, right. reading the Rodong Shimun, yeah. but also watching movies. Uh-huh. And because it is a, a, a different kind of agentivity which is expected from the movies. And this agentivity is purely uh, educational. And we say propagand- propagandistic, but yeah. actually uh, we could see that it is also a way to inform the people of mm-hmm. North Korea, the citizens of North Korea, of the questions of the day and the way to react to the situation of the present days. And that's why this cinema has a different, uh, really different nature, yeah. nature yeah. from our cinema, which is, you know, in a situation of first of, of uh, competition, 
So you have this commercial dimension that we don't have in North Korea. Mm. That changes a lot of things. Yeah. And the other thing is that uh, since it's really completely centralized, this doesn't reflect the society as it is, right. but it reflects the regime as yeah. it would like things to be. So yeah. it's a kind of uh, mir- mirroring, mirroring effect is there, right. but it's different. Yeah, it, it, it is very different. It's, it's a top-down mirroring effect rather than bottom-up. And of course, as you hinted at, there, Kim Jong-il in, in many of his books on um, the arts in North Korea, all artistic output uh, must have this educational function. He s- explicitly rejects time and again uh, art for art's sake. There is no such thing as art exactly. for art's sake. It must have this uh, educational function, this this societal function of uh, of showing society how it should be. Yeah. It is uh, literally described as a weapon. Mm. So mugi. So mugi, it okay. is you know an ideological a, weapon. Ideological weapon. Right. And that's why I'm not surprised that for the children's book, it's quite different because the movies are intended to be seen mostly by adults. Mm -hmm. So the message is different. So that's probably the reason why in socialist reality Mm. is less shown in children's book. So this database then that you've put together, um, obviously it can help people to, uh, to research North Korean films. But are you looking at something bigger than that? Are you hoping that this will help people to gain a better understanding of North Korean society as a whole? I don't think so because, you know, uh, reading a database requires a little bit of knowledge mm-hmm. and work as well because the database is just the, the, the door, the gate to the question. After you have to watch the movies, right. analyze them, yep. and a lot of them. Because I think, contrary to what do some critics, if you really want to do a sociological reading of mm-hmm. movies, not only North Korean, you cannot do it with one or two movies. Uh, you you can do it metony- metonymically speaking, saying, okay, these movies represent a lot of other movies that I'm not going to mm-hmm. uh, speak about today. But at the end, you have to see a lot of movies to see the patterns. And uh, that's why I think a database like this mm-hmm. can help us. For example, you want to know the movies from uh, realist, uh, uh, socialist reality, sorry, a genre from the 1970s. Then you can find a list of them yeah. and then work on that. And that's the beginning, I think. Do you have a personal favorite North Korean film? I do have a lot of movies that I kind of like. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say that I love because you <laughs> know North Korean cinema. It's quite demanding. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm fascinated yeah. by the movies of the 1990s because they are. you see w- the, 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 the stress in which the society is. Yeah. This is it's during the arduous March exactly, period of the famine. Yeah. Exactly. And you see some um, the, the big changes. Mm-hmm. And even though it's not a, a funny movie, mm-hmm. it's uh, considered a, of, uh, um, as a comedy because the, it, there is a happy ending uh, at the ah. end of the movie. It's, for example, a movie which is about a researcher who specialized in potato. Oh, yeah. Yes. I think I've Uri, seen it. Uri Yorisa. Yeah our cook, mm-hmm. and actually is specialized in potato, and his wife is a researcher on rice. She specializes on ah. rice. And you have this kind of competition between the two. And right, because rice is the favored fruit in North and South Korea. Exactly. And potatoes are like, the, well, if we have to, we'll eat them, but we'd rather have rice. Exactly. But since rice during the odious march is not oh, something yeah. we should try to get, yeah. because it's absent, and then people have to eat something else. Right. At that time, the goal of the regime was to make North Korean people eat and like mm-hmm. corn and yep. potato, corn and potato, which yeah. were easier easier at that time to get. Yeah. And uh, they were trying to replace a lot of things mm-hmm. from the Korean staple by, you know, things made with corn and potato. Mm. And that movie is cl- showing this clearly. And it shows also how North Korean uh, discourse can be very flexible depending on the situation, you know, the historical, political, economical situation. So 20 years la- uh, later, before, you could have a movie which could be exactly the opposite, like uh, Uri Hyangi, for example. Yes, you I've know, seen that one on YouTube. Yes, showing that, you know, North Korean people have to eat kimchi and duenjang. Ah. It's kind of part of their DNA. Yeah. But at the same time, you can have a movie which says exactly the opposite and, ah. and showing that potato is a delicious and, and wonderful uh, uh, national food. Right, right. So that going back to your earlier point that every movie is situated in the time that it was made, yeah. So, so coming back to, uh, to one of my favorite stories about uh, Shin Sang-ok and Cheo and he being uh, kidnapped to North Korea, and they worked on about 20 movies, uh, 20 films, from 1984 to 1986 before they managed to escape to the West. As far as you can see, did, did their work have a major impact on filmmaking in North Korea more broadly, or was, he, was his legacy quickly forgotten and they went back to how it was before? 
Well, for me, it's difficult to say because I'm not a specialist of cinematographic studies. Ah. We should ask someone like uh, Gabor, mm -hmm. uh, who you know very well, who yeah. worked specifically on this. I think that, you know, first, Shin sang -wook didn't do 20 movies in North Korea. He worked on the several movies, but he didn't directly direct uh, these uh, 20 movies. Yeah, he, much he less directed than about that. seven and exactly. he produced around 20. Exactly. So if you refer that to the like 800 movies that I found, and, mm. and we are pretty sure that there are much more movies which were produced in North Korea than that, because many of the movies of the 50s have completely disappeared, yeah. even in the list. Ah. So probably it was, you know, this was also uh, on purpose. But anyway, if you see that, mm -hmm. uh, that on this 800 or so uh, production, you have seven movies made by Shin sang -wook, you can see that maybe he was influential in showing different filming techniques mm -hmm. to the technicians around him, other directors. And uh, so this is something which is impossible for us to decipher what was this uh, uh, indirect uh, influence on the people with whom he worked. Mm. That's why I, I cannot answer that question. Okay. When a, a, a specialist of cinema should really see, well, technically that... speaking, what is the influence there. Okay, well then I have a whole bunch of questions. that <laughs> They may be wrong for you because they may be for the cinematographer expert, but let's just ask you anyway. Is there an age that you consider to be a golden age of, of North Korean cinema? Once again, it's difficult to know because most of the movies from the 50s, the early age, where you have absolutely wonderful movies in South Korea at the same time, you know, late 50s and, uh, and early 60s especially, mm -hmm. which is, you know, dubbed as the golden age of South Korean yep. cinema. Yep. And we don't have these movies, most of them. Mm -hmm. We have uh, very few which are left. Then it's difficult to say, but I think that the movies in the 80s, late 70s and early 80s are probably, um, yes, belong to this kind of golden age when, when a lot of money and efforts were uh, in, involved in, uh, in North Korean cinematographic production. And uh, uh, you have great movies at that time. They were also experimenting with different genres and, you know, the, the kung fu movies mm -hmm. and uh, uh, spy movies and... Uh, Uh, they tried to make a kind of a remake of the Tina Titanic later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so, so that, which era again was that? Was that 80s, 80s, I would 80s, say, okay, let's yeah. say 80s, right. yes. Because from the 90s, you still have movies, but you have less and less. Yeah. You have a lot of restrictions. You can see also that they are shifting from the regular film material to more video-related mm. uh, movies. So the quality is sometimes uh, uh, less good. Uh, right, because uh, you're filming direct-to-video rather than with a 16 millimeter exactly. film. Exactly, yeah. And, you know, before that, you can have, aesthetically speaking, yeah. cinematographically speaking, beautiful movies. Mm. I mean, the picture is beautiful, but after from the 1990s, it's, it's more difficult to find that. Mm. And it is clearly very ideologically loaded. The film from the 90s, they have to deal with this arduous march situation. Yeah. So you have movies about, a lot of movies about the industrial production. And, uh, you know, it, it's very technical as a mm -hmm. subject. So when you are accustomed to watch Netflix, you, yeah. you may be lost with these kind of right. themes. So although there are some gems, of course, in the 1990s. But as you know, after that, the production started to decrease as far as we know. And after the arrival of Kim Jong-un, mm -hmm. the production has almost completely stopped. Yes. And after 2016, we couldn't find a movie. I was about to ask you about this. So why has there been this decline in the last, what, decade plus since Kim Jong-un came to power? I mean, Kim is young. He presumably enjoys cinema, maybe not as much as his father did, who you know, reportedly had a collection of tens of thousands of DVDs. But why would that be? Is this a purely a, a budgetary problem or is there something else going on? I'm sure it's not a budgetary problem because they do a lot of other things yeah. like building, you know, amusement parks yeah. and, and ski resorts and Delphinaio. <laughs> yes, and nuclear weapons. Yeah. Exactly. So I'm sure they could, uh, you know, have enough money to make movies. Right. They have the studios, they have the, the you know, the, the, the staff and everything. Yeah. No, I think apparently we have been told, last time I went to Pyongyang, it was in 2018 before yes. covid At that time, there were no North Korean movies in the, in the cinema theaters. And What in was in the cinemas? They were Bollywood movies, Indian movies. We were really? so surprised. Really? D a dubbed, a dubbed or subtitled? D subtitled. Subtitled in Korean. And why? It's because, you know, these kind of Bollywood movies are, ideologically speaking, neutral. Yeah, yeah. They are not dangerous. And you're They certainly not going to see any sex. Exactly. Yeah. And the people around us told, you know, North Korean friends or colleagues told us that they were not very much into this kind of cinema. Huh. But anyway, they were in the theaters. And I asked, why don't we see any more any new North Korean movies? Yes. And I was told that uh, Kim Jong-un decided to 
halt the production hmm. in order to focus on TV dramas and series and make a better quality ah. uh, television series. So production. presumably everybody who was working, had been working in the, st- the film studios, they're not unemployed. They've simply been moved over to television studios instead, right? That's so what I understood. Okay. Huh. Are you familiar? I mean, has there been a, a great output, an increase in output in, in television stuff? That's what I've been told. Okay, exactly. Right. But since I've been focusing on North Korean yeah. cinema, because there is already a lot on my plate, yes, yeah. uh, I don't have the strength to uh, focus on, on also on TV series. Yeah. And I should, because I've been told that uh, there is a new production, which is quite interesting. Right. And what is also, I think, interesting for us is to see that Kim Jong-un reacts a little bit like his father did in the early 70s, when he started to say, well, now let's uh, do a lot of uh, new style movies, Mm -hmm. North Korean style movies, and use them to especially to propagate the image of our father, Kim Mm -hmm. Il-sung, and his uh, saga, his, you know, epic life through through movies. Ah, And he was using the media, the medium of the times. And now in the 2020s, It's understandable that Kim Jong-un, who is younger, different generation, he yeah. wants to use something which is more related to our times, which uh-huh. is a TV series. Shorter, yeah. Okay. Now, I notice in your, um, in your database that the very, very long-running series, The Nation and Destiny, Mun Jokwa, Un, Min Jokwa Unmyong, which I think originally was supposed to, was planned to have more than 100 episodes, but there's only 44. But you've got it just as a single line item in your database rather than one for each film. Why did you decide to do it that way? Well, I think it has been divided in several uh, cells, as far as I remember, if I remember well. We have done that because we try to put them together as North Korean do in their uh, database or Ah, their catalogs. I see. So they go by by kind of bunch, bunches, if you want. Right. (laughs) Yeah. What are the uh, the other um, uh, long running series that uh, I, I think there was the Star of Korea, the The Star uh, of Korea, the the Chosen Epil, which I think was before. Right, so kind of the nation and destiny was the successor to the exactly, story. and it is supposed to be the longest feature film in the world history. Right, yeah. and it, it, it purports to tell some of the history of uh, of Korea after 1945. Right? Yes, yeah. and you have a lot of intricated lives and, and several characters, and it's super complex. Okay, well, when when I look, when I search for nation and destiny in your uh, database, it only comes up once. So mm-hmm. uh, if you have it divided into separate cells, I don't know. It, it didn't come up there for me. Okay, I should. That, you know, that's interesting. That's something uh, we have to work on for sure. You know, improve this kind of thing, and I have to check again because I don't have everything yeah. in mind now. But and uh, that's right, listeners. Uh, I'm being unfair because I'm looking at the database, but Benjamin doesn't have it in front of him. So uh, perhaps a bit unfair there. Um, are you? Have you in, in just putting this database together? Have you discovered any North Korean films that were remade? Same scenario, same. Uh, basic storyline and, and, and all that, but... Except from Chunyang. Yeah. The, the story of Chunyang. Okay. I don't recall that situation. Right. And w- another suggestion, perhaps, for the database for the future, you know, you've got the last column there is for notes. I would, uh, I think it would be worthwhile putting in, making a mark for any film that has a depiction of Kim Il-sung. On indeed, it. indeed. Uh, because that, that's certainly, you know, um, that, that's, a notable that's feature. That's one of the, the goals I have, actually. Yes, and uh, films depicting uh, one of the Kim yeah. family, uh, not only Kim Il-sung, but there are some movies uh, where uh, Kim Jong-il's image ah. appear. It doesn't appear in the movie itself, yes. but you see a picture of him, yep. a still. Ah. And that's genu- usually when the hero or yeah. heroine as a kind of enlightenment. Right. And, uh, <laughs> so it's yes. almost like a religious uh, But it's, it's really rare. Yeah. So, yes, that's something. And, I, of course, I, I have a separate list with these movies, so mm-hmm. I want to add that in the notes section. You're right. And another thing that could be interesting would be uh, if there are any foreign characters portrayed in the films and, uh, and, and how, you know, whether there's a positive valence or a negative valence, because you know, most of the time, especially if they're Americans, they're very negatively portrayed. But... Uh, Sometimes, occasionally, you get a foreigner who uh, comes to North Korea as a, uh, as a skeptic but leaves as a believer. It happens. There are movies like that with Japanese people. Yeah. And also in the co-production with Russia, you have this encounter between uh, Russian people and North Korean people in North Korea. And, and uh, in this case, they are not negatively uh, portrayed, of course, the foreigners. Right. But when it comes to American, I, I haven't seen a movie yeah. yet where they are positively or no, no. neutrally portrayed. So 
that may happen for Japanese mm -hmm. and for South Koreans hmm. and also from, uh, for pe people coming from the, the friendly countries. It's interesting that the Japanese, who normally in, in North Korean texts are uh, portrayed as sort of, you know, the uber villains, that they're allowed an opportunity for salvation, as it were, but the Americans are not. I think that's also something we have to put in the context yeah. because it has evolved with the time. Uh -huh. There are movies where the Japanese are the arch villain yep, yep. and some movies when probably because at that time there was a good relationship between North Korea and Japan, the exchange of, you know, this uh, Zainichi, yes. uh, you, you know. During this, the, uh, the, the Heaven on Earth campaign. Exactly. Yeah. So, and when also a lot of uh, Korean people living in, in Japan decided to go back to North Korea. Yeah. So, there was probably a time when there was a kind of, what shall I say, the, the, the kind of sunshine policy between Japan right. and North Korea, probably, and then the movies were made at that time. Yeah. Okay, so you're hoping that, that by releasing this database to the public, that, that this will become more of a collaborative project, that people will, will come in and, and add more and give more uh, context and exactly. notes and things. Exactly. So yeah. I couldn't open the Google Sheet document to everybody because it would be dangerous we could you know right, uh, make an by accident things. delete something yeah so the or way a movie that just doesn't exist yeah exactly but that's why i uh, just opened the comment ah, okay. function so people can leave me a comment yeah. and then i uh, use the comment and reflect the mm -hmm. comment in the database later are you expecting to receive lots and lots of have you already received lots of comments since you i have a... received uh, one by you <laughs> well, yeah, you yeah. were the first one and hey. as far as i know the only one today okay the, the database had been released published i think one or two months ago yeah uh, let's see yeah two months ago so it's pretty new mm -hmm. and i'm trying to make it uh, you know a little bit more widely known but you know we are very very few people on earth working on north korean cinema i'm, I'm sad to say so yeah. i don't expect a lot of uh, comments but my next goal is to make it more uh, known by the South Korean public right. and researchers especially. Yeah, because the, the, the database is uh, it's bilingual, you know, so you've got the English titles where they're available, but everything else, the original title, the name of the director, uh, uh, the, the actors, etc., that's all in, uh, in, in I, I almost said Hangul, but Chosongul. It's Chosongul, all in Korean. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yes. Okay, uh, now, so uh, good luck with that. I hope you get lots of feedback, lots of comments, and are able to more accurately... You know, find that that the final list. Uh, in the last few minutes we've got remaining, I'd like to talk a bit about a, a book that you published in 2021 that hopefully I hope will come out in English translation one day. It's in French so far. It's about doing uh, field work in North Korea. It's a book you uh, you co-wrote together with uh, Valerie Gelazor. I don't know how to pronounce this. I'm going to say Fair de Terrain, but yeah, exactly. Fair okay. de Terrain. See, that sounded much more French. Now, <laughs> uh, as I said, unfortunately, it's only available in French at this time, but. Give us a little bit of a summary. What's in here? Because it's a very, the way that it's presented, it's a very unique book. It's not a straight text. There's a lot of non prose material in here photographs, film stills, a quiz, humor, cartoons, drawings. So, what's it all about? What are you trying to achieve with this book? Yes, actually, this book. So, we are trying nowadays to work on an English version. So, Hooray. hopefully, we'll have it in English. But the idea was basically to reflect on our arduous march on the. <laughs> On the, Through the uh, field work, okay, yeah. field work in North Korea, doing field work as a social scientist was uh, challenging, is challenging. Well, yeah. And nowadays, you know, it's not any more challenging because we haven't been able to go back to the field, you know, right. for several years because of COVID. But after several uh, joint field work with the other colleagues from France and uh, Belgium, we saw that we were reaching a point when we had to be more reflexive about what we were doing. So going to North Korea and pretending that we can do field work, mm -hmm. which is, you know, one of these methodology, which is central to a lot of social sciences, yeah, not like sociology, anthropology, yeah. anthropology right. cultural geography, even some history, historians have to use it, etc., etc. So if you don't, you cannot go on the field right. to see by yourself, you know, have direct observation. Right, you're not allowed to walk around freely in North Korea. You've exactly. always got your minders with you. So how, how, is, yeah, how do you do field work in North Korea? So it's, it's very difficult and we had to sit down mm -hmm. and instead of just doing this uh, uh, attempt of field work, yeah sit down and, and, and think about what it means to do field work, and not only in North Korea, but take the problem in itself, because there are so many other places in the world where doing field work is hard, dangerous. Mm. That's what we call the closed context. Okay. 
So, for example, if you do, uh, as a sociologist, uh, a field work in a jail, mm. this is also a dangerous and close context. Yes. You don't have to go to North Korea to experience these kind of problems. You can have it in so many countries nowadays in the yeah. world. Yeah. So that's also, that was also you know, important for us to, to take a distance from the problematics. And since we were not able to go back to North Korea and to go on with the field work and produce a, a more positive book, a classical academic book where you, are, you have a lot of facts, mm -hmm. we decided to do anyway a book about the field work itself, it, since we couldn't do the book about North Korea as it is. It's a book about doing field work in North Korea rather than a book of doing field work in North Korea, perhaps. Exactly. Yeah, so okay. it's more a book for specialists who are interested in that question. Right. It can interest people who have no interest from North Korea yeah. because it's more about the, question, the methodological and uh, philosophical question as yeah, well. Yeah. And it helps us also as uh, researchers and authors to share a lot of things that usually you don't share as a researcher in a more traditional article or an academic book. It is our emotions. What do we feel when mm. we go there? Like fear, mm. um, worries, sadness, and a lot of things that usually are blocked by the way we have traditionally to write the social sciences. Yeah. And we want it to play, to be a little bit playful and use different forms uh -huh. in order to kind of break that traditional writing of the social sciences. And, you know, it has been something really, really strong, important in uh, the social sciences, especially anthropology, since the 1980s. Mm -hmm. And it became, it's growing and growing. And nowadays, there are a lot of uh, scientists trying to do social sciences another way. And right. for us, just to finish on that, mm. the reason why we want to also give a lot of nonverbal materials, like, mm -hmm. uh, like photos and drawings, yeah. etc., it's also that because we realize in North Korea that if you want to do a field work using only the traditional verbal interaction, like interview, yep. it's almost impossible. Mm. And I got the intuition that we should try something else. And we tried one year to do what we call mental maps, mental mapping. Mm -hmm. So instead of asking the informant, the people you want to interview, yeah. to answer your questions, and they could be very what shall I say, uh, uncomfortable yeah. with this verbal and oral dimension. We asked them to draw, to draw. Alors, in our case, it was simply draw your map of yeah. Pyongyang. Ah. So it can be uh, the map of the area from where you live, going to work every day, it can be the general Pyongyang. We were very you know, free. Mm -hmm. And that freedom and the fact that we don't use words, yeah. you can write words, but right. you are not obliged. It gave us amazing results oh. and very promising. And yeah. that's something I would like to develop, the nonverbal fieldwork methods like collage and drawing. Ah. Because I think the ideological dimension of drawing, for yeah. example, it is less, it's less strong. Uh, you know, drawing seems to be mm. less loaded for North Korean people, less apparently. Loaded. Right. Because they are, they, they, I'm sure they are told what not to say. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. They, they, are never, they had never have been told what not to draw. How interesting. And yeah. then they were much more free with yeah. their pencils. Uh -huh. And I think that was so fascinating. It opened some hope for us. Yeah. And well, unfortunately, it was just before the COVID right, and the, the, the yeah. door closed. But mm -hmm. uh, that's also something we wanted to show in the book that, you know, using another dimension, which is less considered by traditional scientists, such as photo and drawing, mm. is also probably something useful in our case. Do you have any plans to go back there again to do more field work in the future? And do you think that's possible at this time? We have, you know, we hear many stories of people slowly going back, mm. tourists, etc. So yes, but it we seems hope. to be tourists from favored countries exactly. and members of favored groups like the Korea Friendship Associations, the exactly. Pro Juche Study Associations, that kind of thing. Yes, we have absolutely no vision, mm. no horizon. Mm. What we have been able to do one year and a half ago yeah. already was to do a two-year seminar on Zoom. Believe it or not, I was so surprised it was possible. With people in North Korea? With people in North Korea, with my French colleagues. We, we did that in France, but yeah. you know, it's Zoom, so it's yeah, actually yeah. not France, not uh, North Korea. It's somewhere probably in a, uh, in a computer in the States, or right. I don't know. But anyway, we did the, the, this uh, very interesting uh, live seminar on two days, you know, two long days of mm -hmm. uh, exchanging and uh, with a lot of students in the North Korean classroom. Mm. I mean, oh. graduate students, of course, yeah, PhD yeah. students and professors. And um, it was really interesting. We saw that 
our colleagues were still there. They were in good shape. Yeah. They went through the COVID. So we were really happy to see that. But mm -hmm. we haven't been able to do more than that. What kind of things did you talk about with him? It was about because we had that program, a French funded program on North Grand cities. Okay. So it was about city and new cities, you know, and right. uh, sponge cities and new so technologies. What, what cities? Sponge? sponge cities, you know, like uh, uh, trying to um, regulate the water problems in cities, ah, especially okay. the, yes. So they, w they are super interested in these new right. alternative technologies uh, related also to new energies. So that sounds like they're, they're more looking at it from a geographical standpoint, not, not so much a social science, but more sort of geography. Yes, exactly. But it's, as you know, these kind of problems are intertwined with, mm. you know, geography, but also techniques and sciences, architectures, yeah. urban planning, uh -huh. and also anthropology, because it can also play a role in the way we yeah. use the spaces. So it's at the crossroads. I, I just had an idea about uh, a possible anthropology project that might be possible in North Korea, and uh, maybe it's already been done. You can tell me. If I was a tour guide, a, a Western tour guide going into North Korea regularly with groups of tourists, that interaction with my Korean tour guide partners from the KITC, an ethnography of Korean tour guides, that would be something that is, is possible. Exactly, and that's what we have in mind, actually. Ah, okay. Focus Has it been done yet, as far as you're aware? As far as I'm aware, no, and that's something we want to do. I, I think the proposition is in the book okay. somewhere, ah. and we want to do that. We want also to study hotels, yes. because ah. my colleague, Valérie Gelezo, she did already, with other colleagues, a book on East Asian uh, big hotels, you know, like the Hyatt Hotel, etc., ah. etc., et where, you know, a lot of um, socialization is going on in, yeah. uh, in Asia. You have the wedding halls, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So uh, doing something similar with North Korean hotels yes. and do a kind of anthropological research or, or the dynamics of who is there, the meetings, because a lot of North Korean uh, who have money, uh, yeah. they spend time in these hotels okay. as well in Pyongyang. So there are a lot of possibilities, yes. Okay, wow, well, that's a, a, a hopeful note to finish on. So let's hope that you're able to go back there, you and your colleagues, and, uh, and continue the work there. Uh, and good luck with getting uh, an, an English translation out there with Valérie Gelazo. Give her my regards when you see her next. And also, of course, uh, with this database, uh, we'll share the, uh, the QR code and the link on the, uh, uh, the episode show notes, and hopefully yeah, you'll get lots of response there. Thanks again for coming on the show today, Benjamin Joano. Thank you very much for having me today. Get to the core of Korean Insights with Korea Pro's exclusive Seoul event series. Join us for gatherings that bring you face to face with key opinion leaders, journalists, and experts on South Korean affairs for dinner, drinks, and more. Engage in deep discussions on political, economic, and social issues at special venues across Seoul. From dinners with Korea Pro editors to insightful conversations with renowned guests, each event promises a unique blend of expertise and networking. Immerse yourself in the pulse of Korea. Register now at events.koreapro.org. Ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of our podcast episode for today. Our thanks go to Brian Betts and Alana Hill for facilitating this episode and to our post-recording producer genius Gabby Magnuson who cuts out all the extraneous noises, awkward silences, bodily functions and fixes the audio levels. Thank you and listen again next time. <laughs> <laughs>